Hi, and welcome to the Insiders by Durham Lane, where we get perspectives from industry thought leaders about strategies that are unifying marketing and sales cycles to help accelerate growth inside your world. Welcome to the Insiders by Durham Lane, an industry podcast that connects the worlds of marketing and sales, one guest at a time. I'm your host, Richard Lane. I'm co-founder and chief commercial officer of Durham Lane. We're a revenue acceleration agency helping enterprise customers to create always on channels of meaningful and well-qualified sales opportunities. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by Paul Stevens. Paul is the Director of Digital Health at Omron Healthcare Europe, a world-leading medical device company that provides high-quality healthcare devices and solutions for use at and in the home. Paul, great to have you on the show, and thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Great to be here. So, Paul, just to get things started and to help our listeners um, get a take for you, would you mind just giving a, a quick introduction to you and, and perhaps a, a rapid skirt around your, your professional background to date? Sure, absolutely. So in my current role, as you said, I lead the digital health team at Omron Healthcare Europe. But uh, actually, my my background and professional training is as a chemical engineer. I come from a little bit different direction, perhaps, than uh, than many people that are in kind of marketing, sales, business development. But I started my career after studies at Procter & Gamble. And I spent a, a couple of years really working in in process development organizations, so linked to, to what I'd studied. But I had the unique opportunity within Procter & Gamble to be really close to the commercial and consumer insights teams. And I found that actually that was what was exciting me about the work, understanding what users needed, how they reacted to our products, and how we could improve those to drive the business. So a couple of years into my career, I made that switch and, and really kind of started to focus on product management, consumer insight. And that led me after about eight or nine years or so to Omron. I was really interested in that being in an environment where we're much closer to end users and where the products and services that we're developing have kind of a meaningful impact on people's lives from, from day one, really. I mean, knowing your blood pressure, using nebulizers to treat conditions like asthma or even common coughs and colds. We're really in the hands of users that, that need our products and, and services. For me, that was kind of a really interesting and exciting change. And I've been with Omron now around 12 years in a, a variety of roles, but always with a focus on developing products, services, and understanding what our users really need. Fantastic. Uh, there's got to be a, a pun in there somewhere around chemical reactions and how users react to products and services, I think. So maybe you've maybe you've got sharpened an antennae, Paul, for uh, you know, what, really makes, uh, what really makes your customers tick and how you can create the right products and services for them. When I made that transition from, well, firstly, from, from studying chemical engineering to the real world, it was uh, quite surprising how different the real world is when you're studying you 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 study perfect systems perfect fluids and then you go into a world of laundry detergent where um, <laughs> everything reacts differently to how it does in your studies yeah. and i think it's a little bit similar with people in user insight as well right we try and make these simplified perfect world models and then when we go into the the real world to scale those up and to work with them of course everybody actually reacts differently to your model and you have to adjust and learn along the way yes. so there's some science behind it but there's also a lot of uh, testing learning and experience too and and they react differently but don't necessarily tell you that they're, they're, they're reacting differently so more complicated than uh, than ever absolutely well look, that's um great background thank you i know that'll be really useful for the context of uh, of today's episode one one of the topics that we thought we would look at together was leading effectively through disruption. So again, with your your background, I can see the, the relevance there. And now more than ever, and I, I speak from personal experience of, of being in the world of business, it, it is a tough time to be in business, I think no matter what business you are in. And for healthcare organisations, it must be super tough. So um, be good to get your view on on the world, obviously sharing what you can share from uh, an Omron perspective. But you know, tell us what, what you're seeing out there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it is challenging times from a business point of view, but also times that are full of a huge amount of opportunity. In healthcare systems, there's a recognition that the current way of doing things is not going to be sustainable for the future, particularly in the UK with the NHS, the, the availability of healthcare and the ability for 
but essentially the mindset that a lot of people have that it's the doctor's responsibility to to make them well and keep them well rather than personal responsibility that's something which i don't think can survive into the future and that means changing the way that healthcare is delivered supporting people with self-care which is something of course that that omron has been pioneering for the last 50 years in terms of, of home blood pressure management and and supporting people with self management but it needs to go a few steps further than that and we we're, we're seeing that transition start to happen in the NHS with yeah. virtual wards and the ability for people to be kept at home for longer but also looking at long term condition management and how people can be enabled and empowered to support their own health and and keep themselves healthy I think one of the challenges that that brings to us as an organization is that our customers are asking for more. Well, Omron as a company started out in the days when blood pressure was something that was done by doctors. It wasn't imaginable for many of them that it would be something that people would uh, measure at home for themselves. And it took, I would say, 30 or 40 years still in some places in the world home measurements are not accepted but in general they're now kind of well accepted by doctors and they use them to make decisions but that journey is now accelerating and and clinicians and healthcare systems are asking us well that's just the data how do we get patients to do something with that themselves and we're seeing innovative companies coming to the market that are offering that kind of self-care support but more importantly we're seeing that rise of remote monitoring as well yes. in the virtual world scenario you have people that are for a very short time monitored in a an acute or critical state but now the ask is well how do we keep those people healthy for 2 3 4 5 years into the future and what role does remote monitoring play in that i was just thinking it must be interesting from an omron perspective you're a an organization with tenure so you you've been around a long time you're in a wildly disrupting innovating market how do you i guess two things how do you keep at the front of that innovation and secondly you probably know more than lots of organizations coming into the market so how do you make that count as well yeah it's a great question and it's i think um, a common challenge for many traditional older organizations when you see innovative companies coming into the market and doing things differently it can be easy to also reject out of hand what they're doing and focus on your current business models. Yeah, yeah. But what what we try to do at Omron is to say okay, well what is the end ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve and that's keeping people healthy. We have a a focus on our zero events strategy which is essentially a mission to to reduce the number of heart attacks and strokes from cardiovascular disease. And so measuring your blood pressure is a part of that but it's not the only part of it and if we focus on that as an end goal then the way that we achieve that goal is open for for discussion of course there's challenges in that thinking we have our revenue our profit all comes from that current traditional business and new business models are not necessarily profitable in in the early days so we have to balance the investment into new businesses and new opportunities while still keeping an eye on the current business and making sure that our new investments are really supporting the base business as well. I hadn't really thought about it this way, but it's it's not dissimilar to how IT companies had to shift to cloud provision. So, you know, they'd had a bit an organization that forever had service customer with servers on site and going and supporting those and then suddenly there was this big transition away and you know organizations like Microsoft managed it really really well after some time other organizations you know were were more challenged so it's it I think you're right it's getting the balance isn't it between the traditional what gives us the revenue in the EBITDA of today but then diverting effort and expenditure on on the ways of tomorrow yeah absolutely and we always need to ask ourselves why are we the ones that are doing this so it would never be the case that omron would become a pure software company because somebody else can do that and right. they will probably always be able to do that a little bit better or faster than omron could but we have a huge amount of, of knowledge and brand equity and quality reputation within the market we can leverage then to build the right solutions on top of our product portfolio and make the whole thing stronger but not to try and let's say abandon our heritage and our history and and pivot totally so we're we're looking at how that balance should be and how far 
we should move into the services arena versus devices, but right. they have to be complementary to each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so and that all comes down to, I guess, that that element of leading through change is how do we make sure that the day to day continues whilst we are developing our service and, and product lines in, in other ways. And, and Durham Lane as an organisation is no different on a much smaller scale than Omron, I would hasten to add. One thing you mentioned, Paul, was about new entrants into the marketplace. So I'm just interested to know how you defend your position when new organisations are coming in with perhaps more agility due to their size and, and youthfulness, perhaps with different ways of looking at the world that aren't necessarily correct as well, I guess, sometimes. Yeah, I, I think there's a few different things that, that we try to do. Firstly, we look at to say, what's the real problem that we're trying to solve? So we need to make sure that we're focused on that core direction and that we play to our strengths. So yes, we may not be the most agile, but we do have a strong organization behind in terms of quality, regulatory, data security, and that trust of the Omron brand, which means that particularly in a healthcare environment, customers can trust us to be delivering on those quality elements and to meet our commitments. Whereas we do see in the startup world that companies come and they go and Mm -hmm. uh, you don't necessarily have that consistency over time. So I think that's one key element. The second element is to, to make sure that we're open to what's happening in the market. We understand what we're good at and what we're not. And we look to partner in the areas that we do have those potential weaknesses or or gaps in our offering. So we're not looking to deliver everything ourselves. We're looking to create that environment where innovative startups and companies can add value together with Omron rather than us trying to outcompete the market in every field. So sort of creating your own ecosystems in your marketplace. Yeah, great. And, you know, any any change program, big, small or or somewhere in the middle, means we've got to bring people along on that journey with us. How do you and how does Omron support its people to be successful and and to understand that vision whilst ensuring that the revenues come in to keep the lights on today? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think a, a challenge for all large organizations, how do you transform skills and capabilities to meet those new opportunities and have that right level of focus in, from indeed the, the base business revenue generation, but then taking enough of that time, effort and resources in, into new initiatives that could become large in the future. I think as Omron, we we have done that well over the past couple of years. I mean, it's, it's safe to say that we were and still are to some extent a, a traditional large organization. So we have complex processes, we have a lot of steps in order to get products to market. And that doesn't necessarily fit with the the philosophy of software development, agile changes. Yeah. And as you said, the mindset and the capabilities of the people that, that are needed to be successful in that environment can be quite different. What we've done is that we've tried to create a safe space in a bit of a separated organization with the digital health team where we can recruit people that have knowledge and experience of those operations and protect them a little bit from the day-to-day business so that they can focus on doing what they know is right for for the new business areas. It is also important that we still have really strong links into our base business and for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we have huge amounts of knowledge and expertise within the organization that can really help the new business. We don't want to look exactly like a startup. We're on run for a reason and we want to use those expertise to help us and, and support that new business growth. But secondly, we need to make sure that our digital business objectives are tied really well into the objectives of the wider business for the long term as well. I think it's not the intention to create a completely separate business unit with a separate revenue stream. It's about how can the two businesses really interact and support each other to grow. Yeah, that's it. That's really interesting. We we do a lot of work with big global enterprises that have startup business within within their ventures unit or you know within a within their their organisational structure and and typically I, th- I think a bit like yourselves we find they keep the the global brand name as part of their name, um, probably for that brand recognition, awareness and security. Um, I do know of one example where they haven't taken the brand name because the context and the, um, you know, the way people feel about it wouldn't actually help them in, 
in the sales process mm. that they have for for the business they're building. But in general, I think it it certainly makes life you know, e- easier to build confidence when you've got that legacy brand, which is you know is is a trusted a trusted name. Yeah, and I, I think it's no, the brand is a part of it, but those skills and capabilities that you have sitting behind that are really critical too. So yeah. when we have questions around data security, we have teams of experienced people that have been working on system algorithms and services for, for many years, like, albeit in the traditional device business, but they have that depth of knowledge. As a large company, we have capabilities that startups would not be able to access or it would be very expensive for them to access. Yes. But I can just pick up the phone, get hold of those people and help them to to answer questions or challenges that we have as a team. So it, it really does create a competitive advantage to be part of that organization. On the downside, perhaps we have some processes that have been designed with physical product manufacturer in right. mind that, that we need to do differently. And it does take time to change those processes, to change the mindset of the wider organization to enable this kind of iterative, agile process. So there's there's pros and cons, but as long as we leverage the strengths of the organization, then it's definitely beneficial in terms of stability, quality, reliability that we can offer to our customers. And and it also, you know, means that at a at a leadership level, you've got everyone facing in the same direction and and trying to achieve the same goal as you spoke about earlier, because you know, you can always reach out to someone, but if they're not willing to help you, then it's not been helpful. So, but if you have that at Omron, then that's a, a really positive story for the the organization as a whole, I would I would argue. Paul, one thing we talk about a, a lot on the insiders is is sort of mastering the complex self. But but actually just listening to how you've been talking about some of the disruptors into your marketplace of you know the in in uh you know the their agility and and sometimes their perhaps even lack of experience in into your market. I w- I wonder whether it we could have a little conversation around mastering the defensive cell. So what are the, some of the things that you could share with listeners that you're that you're doing to a- approach the market to give that confidence. We talked a little bit about the ecosystem of of partners that you're you're creating. It'd be nice to dip into that a little bit more if you're able to share some of that with us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when we started, particularly on the journey for remote patient monitoring, where we were then entering into a healthcare market, needing to interact with clinicians directly as users rather than kind of recommenders of, of our products, which has been their, their role traditionally in the past. And also that complex web of uh, stakeholders, so payers being different to users, regulatory and, uh, and other stakeholders having a, the opportunity to say no as well. Actually, that's where kind of our brand quality and our reputation created that first that first line of defense or, or offense to some, in some extent to the competitors, right? Because that's something that we could fall back on. And I didn't experience actually in three years a question or a challenge from a customer that our team couldn't answer or couldn't provide the data for. And I think that's what helped to build our reputation. Of course, we're a work in progress, the same as everybody else, but we know our fundamentals. In conversations with customers, that's why they prefer to choose Omron for for services over, over other players. Also, because they know it, that we are in it for the long run. We're not pivoting after six months because there's been a little bit of money kind of announced yes. by the government yeah. in a different functional area, right? Which we see a lot right. in, in the market of companies that need to chase returns because they have large investor portfolios. They've got to grow their, their revenues quickly. We, we have a 2030 plan. We have stability in our teams and in our market objectives and our customers really appreciate that yeah excellent okay well i I think there's you know lots of factors there that help you to defend against some of the maybe the the new players but also allows you to aggressively go after new business as well and you and offer new services but with the context of security and your leveraging your brand and and credibility as well so a great place to be, but but also one that takes a lot of time and effort and determination to um, to get right. I know. Okay, we've we've added a, a new area into this series of the insiders pool. It's the the actionable insight moment. So um, I guess the the question is, what one thing can you share with the audience that they can take away in action immediately based on some of the the situations you find yourself in? What might that be? Um, 
for me, I think a, a broad insight the, that I've gained over the past years is this concept of knowing what you do well and finding others to do the things right. that you don't do well or to help you to grow capabilities that, that may become core to you in the future. So uh, obviously one example of that and the, the reason that we're talking today is that um, we worked with Durham Lane on sales lead generation because that's an area where we didn't have experience in direct sales and, and lead generation in the type of market that we were entering with remote monitoring. But we also see the same in technology partnerships and actually in building internal teams as well. So it's really important for me as a manager that we're recruiting people into the team that do things well that I don't know how to do or that the team doesn't know how to do. And we have to be comfortable with that, that we're not we're not experts in everything. And our, our teams and our industrial partners should be bringing that expertise so that we can grow faster. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's something I'm really interested in at the moment, Paul, because um, I think probably we've always tried to do too much. And, you know, guess what? A couple of years ago, we really simplified our, you know, who we are, what we do down, and, and it led to rapid growth. And, um, and, and now that partner ecosystem feels, you know, as important, if not more important than ever. So we're in the process of of finding those best fit partners to help us expand our capability to our customers, but remaining true to who we are and what we do and being the, you know, being the best at that as well. So I, I totally get, get that great, great bit of advice. Um, we've had a question in from one of our, our listeners, Alexandra. Um, Alexandra asks us, what are the differences in terms of skill sets and expertise required for employees in a business that transitions from manufacturing to software? So caveat being, you're not going on a total a total transition, but you're going on a part transition from manufacturing to software. So, so what are the differences in terms of skill sets and expertise required? Yeah, I think the key one for us was transitioning into a software development mindset. So when we design a medical device, particularly if it's one that's offering really kind of new or unique functionality. It can take about 10 years from initial design to getting into market and starting to grow. And there's multiple steps along the way, a lot of upfront user validation, of both first in insights and then in product and design, then designing the manufacturing systems, then the production, making sure that quality is stable, and then finally releasing to market. So that that is a really extended process where you have to make sure that your business cases are really solid before you start investing the millions needed in your production lines. You have to make sure that your usability and user insights are correct because once the product is being manufactured, it's very difficult to make changes. Of course, in the software world, the opposite is almost true in that you want to be able to get things quickly to market, test and learn and release fast. That has been challenging for for us as an organization because our processes were not designed to do that. We have stage gate processes that require certain information, business plans, KPIs before you can move along. And to try and operate in a different way within processes that are not just internal they're also your quality management systems that have been signed off by regulators and everything else it's very different so what i'm really proud of with omron as a company and organization is how quickly it recognized those challenges and we started to change kind of across the board so Being a Japanese organization, a lot of the uh, support functions are based out in Japan. And we had really quick engagement from those teams in terms of how can we support you and what do we need to do differently? Although it's it's a mindset more than a specific capability, but yes. that that change is essential to being successful. And of course, something which digital native startups will design their processes to begin with in that way, that's something that we've had to adapt along the way. Yeah, I often talk about refueling in midair. That's that sort of classic thing, isn't it? Where you're not only refueling, you're building a new fueling station in in midair and using a different type of fuel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, it's quite a change. And of course, the yeah. on the sales end, the, the sales structure is very different too because we're talking about licensed sales versus device sales. So the capability and the knowledge that your on-the-ground team need is very different from kind of retail key accounts 
management and um, trade marketing, those kind of activities that we have in the traditional business, to account managers that really understand the healthcare system, the stakeholders, that again, that relationship of payers, users, and other influencers that all need to have a yes before you can move forwards. So that's been quite a journey for us too, but we we like to leverage the capabilities of the people we have within the organization. So giving people the opportunity to learn in this new environment, but bring the skills and knowledge that they have from their existing experience into the new world has been really exciting as well. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, the the last question for me, Paul, is is uh, sometimes the hardest one to answer. Actually, this is the uh, request for a song to be added to our uh, the Insiders Spotify playlist, which is, I must admit, a an eclectic mix of uh, of songs um, from various genres and decades. Uh, have you um, have you got a song for us to add on your behalf? Yeah, so I'm I'm going to go a little bit left field. So it's uh, an Eminem song all right okay yeah <laughs> so it's um it's stan from eminem and uh excellent so the the reason is um well I, actually i i've always felt that i wanted to be a bit of a performer but i've been held back by my natural talents in that i have no singing <laughs> ability and i tried to play multiple different instruments and and never really managed to master any so the okay. stage life wasn't really for me, but joining a Japanese company, yes. of course, karaoke is a, a part of the yes. culture, and it's something that uh, that we do like to do also as a European team when we're having events. So an Eminem song like Stan is perfect. I find somebody in the team who can sing, and they do the Dido bits, and I just go <laughs> ahead on the on the Eminem bits. <laughs> it's uh, it's always fun. Oh, well, that's brilliant. We will, we will absolutely get that added. That is uh, fun. Is that the one where there's a Christmas version as well? Is there? I haven't heard that, but I might need to go and look for it. <laughs> anyway, there is definitely a there is definitely a, a Santa version. I think I think it's that one. Okay. But we will get that added. Great great track, and and I love the story. And and I hadn't really. I hadn't really put together the fact you're a Japanese company in karaoke before, so I should have, and I should have done. But that's um, that's that's brilliant. We'll get that added. And I'm definitely, uh, I'm going to be looking for that Santa version because we got our Christmas party coming up, so it could be a different string in my boat. I will. I'm, I'm sort of hoping I'm right now. We'll we'll have to cut this entire bit from the episode if I'm wrong, but we'll find out. Look, Paul, it's been really great having you as a guest on the Insiders. Thank you. Um, I. Uh, I, I really enjoyed listening and, and learning from you around the you know the difficult times we're in, but how an organization such as the the size and scale of Omron has has found a way to become agile, has found a way to shift. And um, you know, you've shared some really, really interesting points on on the journey as we've talked that through today. So um thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, to our listeners, thanks for tuning into The Insiders. Please subscribe on your preferred podcasting site to ensure you're notified of all new episodes as and when they're published. And if you'd like to learn more about Durham Lane, our outsource services, and our unique method of selling at a high level, please visit durhamlane.com for more information. And we'll see you soon. The Insiders by Durham Lane. Subscribe today to never miss an episode.